Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what we're going to do is an impulse momentum tutorial, uh, which means we're going to do a short little lecture on impulse momentum, uh, the theorem, how you can calculate impulse, how you can calculate an average force if the force is not constant with time. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to apply that knowledge to solve six problems. Now if you just want to skip to the problems, I left them. There's a link in the... Uh, this video description down below, it'll link you to a PDF document with the six questions that I'm going to solve in this video. So have a look at them. Some are conceptual, some are calculations. Um, and anyway, let's get started. All right, what we're going to do first is just a quick one pager on what is impulse and the impulse momentum theorem. And what I want you to do first is just consider this example here where you have a ball striking a tennis racket. All right, so imagine I have just a small cartoon to illustrate that. Uh, I have a tennis ball kind of moving in one direction. It might have some initial velocity. Uh, the tennis ball also has a mass M. And then it might strike a racket. Let's go ahead and do a quick racket over here. Something like this. An old wooden racket. There you go. And now the tennis ball, after being hit by that tennis racket, might move in a different direction, right? It might move in exactly the opposite direction, so some final velocity. The mass hasn't changed. So what we have here is that this tennis racket hit the ball, so there was a certain force exerted on the tennis ball from this tennis racket, right? We had a force, and that force was acting for a little bit of time, right? It wasn't quite instantaneous. It might be a couple milliseconds, Imagine I had a graph over here where this is the force exerted by the tennis racket on the ball. In this case, this is the simplest case because we have that the force is simply a constant value. And you can see from uh, the graph over here, if I'm plotting force versus time, that this force was acting for a period. It goes started at 2 and went all the way to 8, and these are in units of milliseconds. So this whole time is delta t, and this is 6 milliseconds. All right, now if we go back and think about this, I'd like to start off with Newton's second law. Now that's the most famous one, right? Newton's second law, let's write this out. Uh, Newton's second law says you add up all the forces. In this case, there's only one, so we're just going to call it F. Uh, that has to be equal to mass times acceleration. Uh, except remember the acceleration of an object, the definition of acceleration. If I open up a bracket over here, it was the change of velocity. That's V final minus V initial. Don't forget these are vector quantities here. And divided by delta T. All right, if I take this one step further now and I distribute through by the mass what the equation, Newton's second law, simply ends up re, uh, being is force is this quantity here, mass final minus mass times V initial. And again, divided by delta T. Now I'm going to introduce a new definition, something we call momentum. Momentum takes the letter P. Let's go ahead and write it out. Uh, momentum. And that's simply the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So if I look at this term, actually, look at here. I'll just put two brackets over here. This is a mass times a velocity. So I can call this guy here P final. And this here is mass times V initial. Well, I can call this the initial momentum of an object. And it's also a vector. I can't forget that. It's a vector because it's simply proportional to the velocity of the object. All right, we're going to do one more step. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this delta T here and I'm going to bring it upstairs. And actually, when I do that, this introduces one last definition. This is called the impulse. And everything together is the impulse momentum theorem. So let's go ahead and write it. Usually for impulse, sometimes people use the letter J. J is a vector. And the definition is, if I bring that delta T over there, it's simply force multiplied by that time. And that there has to be equal to P final minus P initial well, this is simply the change of momentum of an object. All right, this is super important, folks. This is the impulse momentum theorem. Now, the case that we considered here was, well, this force, at least in this figure over here, the force was constant. 
Okay, so the equation here is rather simplified for a constant force. We're going to look at what happens now if the force is not constant with time. How would I calculate the impulse? But even looking at this equation, we have two ways of calculating the impulse. Uh, number one, you can either take the force multiplied by the time. If the force is constant, that's one way. Another way to calculate the impulse is to look at the change of momentum of an object. Okay, so we really have two methods of calculating the same thing. So a lot of problems, you have to look at this. Sometimes they give you information to calculate the left-hand side. Sometimes you're provided with information to calculate the right-hand side. All right, let's go have a look at what happens now if the force is not constant and how you calculate the impulse from a graph. In many cases, you're given a force versus time diagram like the one shown here on the left-hand side. Now, if the force is constant, you can see from this equation here, it's simply force times delta t. So in this particular case, all you'd have to do is, again, my delta t is, uh, goes from 2 to 8, so that's simply 6 milliseconds. Um, force times delta t, you can see, is really simply the area under this rectangle. Okay, so any force versus time diagram, all you have to do is look at the area under the curve. That is how you calculate the impulse. So in this case, if I wanted to write it out, I would say J is my impulse. Uh, the force is, just write it out, force multiplied by delta T. Uh, the force in this case is 200 newtons. And while well, the time is six milliseconds, uh, that's six divided by a thousand. So what you can do now is just cross out a couple zeros, cross out a couple zeros here, and you get 12 over 10. So the impulse in this case, J, was simply 12 over 10, uh, which gives me 1.2. Now if you think about the units of impulse, the units of impulse are going to be in units of newtons multiplied by seconds in this case. There's one more thing we need to do for the impulse is what happens if the force is no longer constant? Well, have a look at this case, right? This case over here, what we have is... We've got a force that is zero for a while, and then it goes up kind of linearly. It goes all the way to 400 newtons, and it goes back down, right? The force constantly changes anywhere from two to eight milliseconds. There's always a different value of the force. So the question is now, how do you calculate the impulse J in this case? Uh, before we had simply force multiplied by delta T. Um, that was for kind of a simple case. However, the more general case is simply just to look at the area under the curve, okay? Area under the curve. And if you're taking an algebra-based physics class, you're probably going to be dealing with rectangles and triangles. And that's all you have to do is simply break down your shape into some things that are easy to calculate. So this is what I would do for this case. I would look kind of at this side. I would calculate the area under the curve for this one. And then I'd go on the other side. Oh, here's another triangle. And triangles are kind of easy to calculate. So I'd look at the area for this one. Uh, for each triangle, I know that the area is simply one half uh, base times height. So let's go ahead and calculate the impulse for this one. So for the first one will be the blue one. Uh, what do we have here is one half. Now, what's the base? The base here is going to be four milliseconds. So that's going to be four divided by 1,000. And multiplied by the height. The height is going to be 400 newtons. All right, so that's the blue one plus, well, we have to add this, uh, this other side, the purple side. We have one half. Now, what's the base in this case? It's only two milliseconds, so it's two over a thousand. And then that's multiplied again by the height of that uh, triangle. That's also 400. All right, what you can do now is just simply do a little bit of math. Uh, one half is common for both. Uh, in the middle here, we're going to be left with 6 over 1,000 and multiplied by 400. All right, you can carry this out. You can cancel out a few zeros. 1, 2, 1, 2. What we're left with in the numerator is 24 divided by 20. Uh, 24 divided by 20. And again, it looks very, very similar to the previous case. What we also get here is 1.2, and the units that we have are newtons multiplied by seconds. That is the impulse produced by this force, which is not constant, 
but we integrated the area under the curve and that's the answer we got and that's the impulse pretty straightforward folks all right, I now want to define something called an average force. So if we looked at this uh, red curve over here, what we ended up getting was an impulse, which was equal to 1.2 newton seconds. And we got that by looking at the area under the curve. Okay, now this force is not constant, right? The force varies with time. Uh, the average force, however, the average force is defined here in the figure. And if I look at an average force, the one thing I notice is that it is constant for the same period of time. So that's key that it's constant. And the delta T is the same as the more complicated profile. The key now to calculating the average force is that the impulse has to be the same as the more complicated profile. Impulse is also the same. So how would we write the impulse for this case, for the blue case? Well, the impulse I would call J, and it has to be equal to 1.2, but to calculate it, it's super easy. It's simply the average force and multiplied by delta T. And we just said delta T has to be the same. So delta T has to be six milliseconds in this case. So the calculation would look like this, right? My average force for this particular case multiplied by delta T. That's the impulse. That's the area under the curve of the blue rectangle. That has to be equal to the area under the curve of the more complicated profile, which in this case is 1.2. So the average force, all you have to do is just bring the time on the other side. So you get 1.2 divided by delta T. And again, my delta T now has to span over the same region. This is six milliseconds. So this is six divided by a thousand. I'll just bring the thousand over here. So what you end up getting here is 1200 divided by six. That gives me 200 newtons. So that's why this line here is drawn at 200 newtons. This is an average force of something that is way more complicated than that. But the key is that the impulse for both of these curves are going to be the same. All right, now that we have the basics down, what you wanna do now is download the PDF, have a look at the problems, there's six problems, try to solve them on your own, and then come watch the rest of the YouTube video, and we'll go over the solutions in detail. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments section, I'll get back to you. Now here's problem one, we have uh, Megan and Jason, they push off each other, uh, they're on frictionless ice. Jason's mass is twice that of Megan. So actually this guy here is 2M, uh, she's only M. All right, what else? Which skater, if any, experiences the greater impulse during the push? All right, so the key to this problem here is uh, if they push off each other, um, there's going to be a force acting on each one. So they push off, there's going to be a force acting on Jason. There's also going to be a force acting on Megan. Uh, if there's a force, that means there is going to be an impulse. And the amount of time that that force acts is going to be the same for both of them. So that means that the impulse has to be the same. Impulse, impulses are equal. Remember the forces are gonna be equal because this is really Newton's third law at work here. For every action, there's this equal and opposite reaction. So he pushes off her, she pushes off him and those forces are equal and opposite to each other. So what we have here is that J, our impulse, which is F multiplied by delta T, has to be the same for both. Now for Jason, that has to be equal to the change of momentum of Jason. For Megan, the impulse has to be the change of momentum of Megan. Well, let's write this out a little bit more, right? Again, we're not gonna worry too much about the direction here. We know they're gonna move in opposite directions because the force is in opposite direction. But let's look at the change of momentum of Jason. Well, it's his mass times final velocity, right? That's just our definition. So the mass is 2m v final minus 2m v initial. Uh, for Megan, her mass is only m. So it's simply mass of v final of Megan minus mass v initial of Megan. Now, if we assume that they're both at rest initially, we can cancel both of those out, okay? What we're looking for in part B now is which skater has the greatest speed. So we want to know their final velocities. 
Well, have a look for Jason. For Jason, here's my equation. And this is really V final for Jason. This guy is V final for Megan. All right, if we focus just on the Jason equation over here, we have this impulse, which is the same for both. And at the end, what you end up getting is that the V final for Jason is going to be equal to the impulse force times delta T and divided by the mass of the person, 2M. For Megan, on the other hand, V final for Megan, uh, it's the same numerator, F delta T, same impulse, but divided by only 1M. She has half the mass, all right? because of that statement right here in the problem. So that means that the final velocity for Jason is going to be small, right? He has more mass, he has more inertia, therefore there's more resistance to change in motion. V final for, uh, for Megan is going to be bigger, okay? All right, there's kind of a nice conceptual problem for impulse momentum. All right, so here's problem two. We have a sled... Uh, and a rider gliding over horizontal ice at 4 meters per second uh, have a combined mass of 80 kilograms. Let me just kind of put that on my figure over here. And we have mass equals 80. Uh, the mass doesn't change. It's still 80 over here. But then it hits a rough spot over here. And then it slows down so that after that rough spot, it's only going at 3 meters per second. So what impulse was delivered by the sled by the force of friction? Right, during this section over here, there was probably a force of friction acting on the sled, which made it slow down. That makes a lot of sense, right? So in this case, we're simply looking for the impulse. Let me just write it as J. Um, now, we don't really talk about how much time it's going over there. So again, if you were going to write it all out, you'd probably say something like friction uh, multiplied by some amount of time has to be equal to the change of momentum of the object. In this case, well, it's probably easier to use the right-hand side of this equation. Again, this is mass of the object multiplied by V final minus V initial. Right here, I just kind of took the mass out, but this is all we have here. So what we have here is a mass of 80 kilograms, and it slows down. Its final velocity is only 3, and its initial velocity was 4. So all you have to do is simply go like that, and now you get minus 80. Uh, again, that's going to be in the units of either change of momentum or units of newtons multiplied by seconds. They're actually the same. I just like newton seconds for me for impulse. Notice that it's negative. Why is it negative? Again, if you think about it the other side, it's negative because it simply slowed down, right? The final was less than the initial. And all this does, it simply tells me the direction of the impulse. It's a vector quantity. So the impulse has to be in this direction. This is the impulse direction. One thing about the impulse direction, it's always in the direction of the force, right? In this case, it's going to be the force of friction. Friction tries to slow it down. All right, if the sled now was in contact for this period of time, which they're telling us now is 1.5 seconds, uh, what's the average force exerted by friction? Again, if we're looking at an average force, the impulse you simply calculate by multiplying both things. It's the area of the rectangle. Since we know the impulse is negative 80, um, all we have to do now is simply do force of friction multiplied by time, which in this case is 1.5 seconds. This here has to be equal to negative 80 newton seconds. So the force of friction uh, is going to be 80, again, negative 80, uh, divided by 1.5, uh, that's 3 over 2. I put that in the calculator, I think I got negative 53.3 newtons. Again, negative sign simply tells me the direction. Uh, the magnitude is 53.3. Pretty straightforward problem. Problem three is almost identical. We have a mass of a truck, which is 104. It's traveling with some initial velocity right here. So we have some initial momentum. But this is initial, 35 uh, meters per second. Put that on my cartoon. Uh, hits the brakes, so there's going to be a force applied. There's an impulse. If the brakes are now applied for a period of time of two seconds, uh, what is the average force required to bring it to a rest? All right, so there's kind of a really important word over there. That means that V final has to be zero meters per second. 
So again, we look at the impulse momentum theorem. The thing that's slowing it down is going to be the brakes, right? So we're going to have friction that's slowing it down. All right, so what we have is the force. So in this case, is going to be friction. Let's go ahead and write it out again. Multiplied by delta T, which is going to be two seconds, has to be the change of momentum of the truck. Uh, this is P final of the truck minus P initial. And you take this one step further. It's the mass of the truck. I just take that out because it's common with both. Minus V initial. All right, there's something we could simplify now in this problem because V final is zero. It comes to a rest. So the only thing we have left here is ma uh, negative mass multiplied by V initial. And this has to be the force of friction. Multiplied by delta T. All right, so we can calculate what the average force is. Again, it's average because we're simply taking the area of a simple rectangle, right? We're only multiplying one number multiplied by the whole time that it's being applied. So if you bring the delta T down below, let me just erase it from here, bring it down below, and then you substitute the numbers, we should be able to calculate what the average force is. Notice the negative sign again, and that simply tells me that the friction is in the opposite direction of the initial velocity. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So what we have is 104, uh, V initial is 35 meters per second, and divided by the time, which was two seconds. Uh, I put that in my calculator, and what I got was uh, that the average force of friction uh, for this problem was, again, the magnitude is 1820. The negative sign just tells me that it's in the opposite direction of the initial velocity. All right, kind of a nice little problem for impulse momentum theorem. All right, problem four is here. A 200 gram ball is dropped from a height of two meters. It bounces off a hard floor and rebounds to a maximum height of 150. Okay, so it doesn't go as high. <clears throat> uh, figure below here shows the impulse uh, received from the floor. What maximum force does the floor exert on the ball? Okay, well, let's kind of draw it out here. Now here we have this. So we have a ball, it starts at two meters. Go ahead and kind of mark this off, two meters. And then on the way back, it only goes up this way, right? So imagine right before it hits the floor. Right before it hits the floor, it's moving pretty fast. It has some initial velocity. And then right when it's down here, Right, it's moving up and it also has some, say, final velocity after hitting the floor. So the momentum changed direction here. Um, and this kind of final height down over here, if I was gonna just kind of denote this, uh, the final height here would be one meter and 50 centimeters. Okay, so um, how, do we, how do we find this maximum force? Well, first of all, there is going to be an impulse here, right? There's gonna be an impulse because look at, we have some area under the curve. So let's find an expression for the impulse. And then we also have a change of momentum. So we also gotta to try to find what are these initial and final velocities here? Um, so a couple of things we wanna find, initial and final. Uh, for these, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a concept of conservation of energy, right? Over here at this point, I have a lot of gravitational potential energy. And right before it hits the floor, you know, after falling two meters, all I have is kinetic energy. So let's kind of look at this picture here. So initially, all we have is gravitational potential energy, and that's simply mgh, right? It simply depends on the mass and how high it is. And then right here, right at position two, all of that gravitational potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy right here would be one half m, and it would be the initial velocity squared. Uh, you can see here that the mass cancels out, and what we're left with here is simply that the initial velocity equals the square root of two gh. Uh, for the other case, it's kind of exactly the same, except the height for the final over here is gonna be 150. So you see that something that is not going as fast is not gonna go up to two meters. It's only gonna go up to uh, one meter and 50 centimeters. So actually, if you substitute the values um, in this side, what I found was this was like 6.3 meters per second. And for V final, V final, I kind of do the same conservation of energy, except it, it's height two in this case, and height two is only uh, 1.5 meters. 
So I'll go ahead and substitute in the numbers for there. And I find that the velocity right at the bounce, right after the bounce, when it changes directions, was 5.4 meters per second. So we definitely have a change of uh, the magnitude changes and also the direction, right? Don't forget about the direction. That's going to be important for momentum. All right, so what else can we do now? Well, we can find the change of momentum, and that is the impulse, right? Remember, our impulse is going to be, if I look at the right-hand side, delta P, and it's delta P of the ball. So this is going to be mass of the ball, which we know, 200 grams, and multiplied by the change of velocity, V final, as a vector, minus V initial as a vector. So don't forget that. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to choose the up direction to be the positive direction. Now here you have to do this because when you're taking the difference here, you're taking the difference between vectors. So if I go ahead and substitute the mass of the ball, uh, 200 grams is 0 0.2 kilograms. Okay, now how do I evaluate the change of velocity here? Well, V final is going up. Its magnitude is 5.4, so that's positive 5.4. Minus, minus V initial. Uh, v initial is going down. So going down is negative, so 6.3. Okay, so you see these two negative signs, they turn into a positive. And now you simply evaluate that the change of momentum for this problem, delta P. Um, substitute that in my calculator and I found that it was equal to 2.34. Now I'll leave it in units here of momentum, which are kilograms, meters per second. All right, that's the change of momentum or the impulse, right? It's also J, right? There's two ways to calculate J. So all we have to do now is find the impulse on the other side. And that's very, very easy. It's just going to be the area under this triangle. Well, what we have is, let's kind of define something over here. We're going to call delta T this five milliseconds. And again, all I'm really doing here is if I'm going to break this down in half, but you could see that if I bring this triangle, I flip it over, it's actually going to fill out uh, what's missing over here. So it really turns into a rectangle, and the rectangle has a width equal to delta T over 2. And the height is simply going to be F max. That is actually the total area under the curve for this triangle. Okay. And we know that this is the impulse. Well, the impulse, we just calculated. This has to be 2.34, right? We have no choice. So this allows us to find what F max is. If I write it down, F max is going to be equal to 2 times 2.34. And all of that divided by delta T, which in this case is 5 milliseconds. That's 5 divided by 1,000. Uh, let me just put the 1,000 up here. All right, we got to substitute everything in the calculator. I think if I did this correctly, I got... 936 newtons. Okay, kind of a nice problem. Uses a little bit of conservation of energy in order to find the velocities right before it hits the floor and right after it rebounds. And then after we use our definition of uh, impulse, we actually use both sides of the equations this time, but we got to our final answer for the maximum force. In this case, it wasn't an average force, right? This is a maximum force. All right, problem five reads like this. Has an object uh, two kilograms moving to the right with a speed of one meter per second. It experiences a force as shown below. What is the speed and direction after the force ends? Okay, well, uh, pretty straightforward. So we, let's just kind of draw our object. And, well, it's moving like this. Uh, v initial is going to be one meter per second. And then there's a force acting on it. For half a second, we have a two newton force. Uh, the mass of this object is 2 kilograms. All right. So uh, we can calculate the impulse, right? J is our impulse equals to, in this case, the force is constant. So it's really the average force and multiplied by delta T. And that should be equal to the change of momentum of my object, which is going to be equal to P final minus P initial. So P initial is very, very easy right here, right? P initial is simply the mass times the velocity. Mass times velocity gives me two. And that's in kilograms, meters per second. All right, so I know this term. What is the impulse over here looking at the area under the curve? All right, let's calculate the area under the curve. We simply have a kind of a rectangle or a square looking thing. It's simply the force, which is going to be two, multiplied by 
half a second. Well, that's easy. That's just one, right? It's one Newton seconds. Well, that has to be equal to P final and minus two, which we just calculated. So the final momentum, which is right here, P final, is going to be equal to um, the impulse, which is one, and plus two. Uh, so the final momentum has to be three meters per second. Oh, and kilograms. Don't forget my kilograms. <laughs> Uh, what they're asking for, though, however, is the speed and the direction. Well, the direction is positive, right? This is a positive direction, so the momentum has to be like this. It was initially moving like this, and the force was positive, so the force is also in the same direction, okay? Same average force direction. All right, so we want to know the speed. Well, once you know the momentum, all you have to do is just realize that this is equal to mass multiplied by the final velocity. So the final velocity is going to be my final momentum, 3.0, and divided by the mass, which is 2 kilograms. So you get 1.5 meters per second. Pretty straightforward. Nice little problem. Uh, quick and easy for this one. All right, so here we have a problem 6. Uh, we have a baseball that moves horizontally with some initial velocity, um, which is 35 uh, meters per second. So it has some initial momentum, and it's moving this way, right? Let's write it down as a vector. Uh, after striking the bat, the ball moves vertically upward. Oh, so that's kind of different. Um, so let's just do the ball over here. And after, it's going to be moving vertically upward. So that's the direction of the final velocity. And what else? It's moving at half its initial speed. Oh, so that means it's going to be moving at 17.5 meters per second. Right? That is my velocity vector after. So you can easily calculate the momentum before and the momentum after simply by multiplying each of those numbers by the mass, right? That case is pretty straightforward. So let me go ahead and start by doing that, right? So my initial momentum as a vector quantity is simply mass times the initial velocity. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to call, since this is kind of a two-dimensional uh, problem, we're going to use this coordinate system. This is going to be x and that's going to be y direction. And now let's go ahead and simply define it. So what we have before is our mass, which is 0 0.14 kilograms. And my initial velocity is 35. Uh, put that one in the calculator. Uh, what you end up getting is approximately uh, 4.9 kilograms meters per second. Uh, that's the initial momentum. And again, that's going to be in the x direction, um, uh, as I denoted over here. So what else? Uh, after, what we can do, a P final is simply going to be half of this number, right? Because the speed is half. The mass is the same. So let's go ahead and just do P final over here. P final as a vector is going to be half of 4.9, which is 2.45. Again, kilograms, meters per second. And again, that's going to be, that's the direction, right? That's the direction of that vector. All right, now if we think about this now, what they want now is find the impulse. All right, that's our question. Find the impulse delivered to the ball. If you want to find the impulse delivered to the ball, uh, all we have to do now is find, well, write down the definition. J is the change of momentum, right? And that's a vector quantity. So it looks like P final minus P initial, right? That's the definition of the impulse. So let's do it as a vector. Now I'll do over here just to give myself a little bit more space. Uh, let's shrink that down a little bit and move it over. It'll kind of ruin the vector there, but that's okay. And uh, let's draw the vectors. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to draw the first vector over here. This is the vector P final. Uh, so that vector P final goes something like this. This is P final. Uh, its magnitude is 2.45. I won't write the units for now. And what we want to do now is we want to add or subtract the vector P initial. All right, well, P initial uh, plus P initial. Remember, P initial is this vector over here. It's in the same direction as the velocity, and its magnitude is 4.9. So the vector negative P initial should look like this. This is negative P initial. And the magnitude of this one, notice I made it a little bit longer, was 4.9. So what you can do now is you can find the resulting vector. This vector right here, this is the impulse. This is the vector J. This is the vector P final minus P initial. 
if you wanted to, you can write the vector in components, right? I could right away write that the vector j is equal to an x component and a y component. Now the x component of this vector is going to be minus 4.9 and the y component is going to be simply 2.45, right? That is the vector j and again, all of that is in kilograms, uh, meters uh, per second. Now, if you wanted to, you can then find how big is the vector j? What's the magnitude of the vector j? If you know both components, now all you have to do then is simply use Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem would say you simply square both components and you add them up, all right? 2.45 squared. I have omitted the negative sign here because, well, once you square it, that's going to go away. Uh, the magnitude is 5.5. Now, let me just write that in Newton seconds. That's the magnitude. That's how big the impulse is. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is, well, what is the direction? What is this angle theta? Uh, you've defined everything. You can just do it in terms of, say, tangent. Uh, so let me just clean this up a little bit. Maybe we'll do it down over here. So what we have here is tangent of the angle theta. The way I've defined it here is would be opposite uh, over adjacent. Okay, so that would be 4.9 over 2.45, uh, which we know is simply 2. Okay, well, what about, we don't want tangent of theta, we actually want the angle. Uh, so the angle theta is going to be the inverse function. And 2, when you put that one in the calculator, you get an angle of approximately uh, 63.4 degrees. So you've defined everything about the impulse. You know the magnitude. Magnitude's over here. The direction is given by uh, this angle theta in the triangle, and we also have given in terms of the components of the impulse. So this problem in two dimensions, still pretty straightforward. Uh, this is how you would attack this problem.